That's fine. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, am I going to move the slide? Yeah. Um, just bear with my, my computer takes a little bit of sound. Um, this is, the, as Mary was saying, this is the fourth in a series of five um, webinars that, um, that, that we're doing. And um, the, the date there for the fifth webinar is on the screen now. Um, that will be looking at using communication devices and embedding the, the use of those into, um, into the day, classroom day. So, today we're going to be talking about using switches away from the computer. By and large, um, I've spent I spend ninety percent of my time talking about people using switches and about um, and about software and all of those things. But it's very, very important that we don't just focus on using switches with the uh, with the with the computer. We need to um, we need to look at and think about adding some breadth to what we do. Um, There'll be one really, really useful uh, website which which I'll bring up at the very end of our session, and it links to a document called the Switch Progression Roadmap. This is a, a document that I wrote uh, middle of last year, and basically what it what it tries to do is it tries to lay out um, a roadmap of skills really um, in the use of switches from experiential um, learners, so people who are not interacting and not initiating right through to people who are confident, independent scanners, so people who are able to use switches to make choices, uh, and everything in between. And in that book, I talk quite extensively about the use of switches away from the computer. In this session, I'm going to split it up really into three steps. Uh, the first will be what, and about what we might use away from the computer, how, and the, and the technology that we might use. Uh, the second part of it will be how we'll use it and how that fits in with the way that that, our, that, that we understand our students learn to use switches. Uh, and, and along the way, I'll be dropping in examples of how we might use that uh, and examples of things you might want to try in the classroom along the way. So uh, we'll see how we go. So breadth is important and it really I can't say that enough um, I visit very very many schools and I'm very lucky to get to visit schools all around the world uh, and by and large every single school I go into I see the same things uh, pretty much everybody wants to show me all the wonderful things they're doing on the computer and um, and I hardly ever really get to see people using using switches away from the computer um, and it's very 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 important that we see our students um, doing that, that we're not restricting ourselves to one particular form of input, one particular way of working. It's important that we give our students a breadth of experience in using switches so that they use uh, as often as we possibly can. And I can't, again, I can't stress the importance enough of how we need to be using switches as much as we can within our general school day. Um, there are four kind of areas that I'm going to split this up into today. Uh, the first will be um, switch toys, uh, and I'm sure we're all familiar with the, um, I call them the dreaded pig and the elephant, because by and large, every single school I visit has at least one pig and at least one elephant, uh, and they've probably been there for six or seven years, and the children, if their children use them at all, they've been using them for years and years and years and years. And I'm not knocking them, they're great toys, but they're a bit boring. Um, there are lots and lots of other types of toys that we can use, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The second will be electrical devices. Um, and by electrical devices, I mean things like um, um, lights, fiber optics, bubble tubes, hair dryers, things that we can connect through a device called a power link. I'm sure everybody's familiar with uh, familiar with the power link. I put a picture on there of the power link four, which is great. But you might have a power that one of the other power links. They all work in roughly the same way. They allow you to connect um, electrical device to it and operate it with a switch. The third and my absolute favourite is um, a communicator. So I put a picture there of the Big Mac. I've said this many many times. The Big Mac is your best friend when you work with switch users. It gives us an opportunity to to use switches in pretty much every single thing that we do in the school day, from the child walking into this into school in the morning and saying hello 
to then leaving it, leaving school in the evening and saying goodbye. And every single thing you do, you can incorporate some switch use, and that's very, very important. And the final area um, is our multisensory rooms, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, about how how we might use switches within a multisensory room. I'm guessing you guys have all got or ha got or have had ha access to multisensory rooms. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about them in a second. So that's the kind of technology that we're going to be looking at. Looking at. Um, so I'll move the slide and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about toys. I mentioned uh, pigs and elephants and, and really um, they're great but they've been around a long while and there's so much better, many better toys found around these days. Pig and elephants, pigs and elephants have their place. They're what I call walking toys. They walk, something happens and they keep walking. But they're much, much more interesting toys. My current favourite is on the screen there, is the, the Roaring Dinosaur. He's absolutely brilliant. And uh, I've taken him work, using him with lots and lots of children in a variety of different schools. Uh, and they love him. Um, there are lots of other types of toys too. If you visit the AbleNet website, you'll see a huge range of, of switch adapted toys, which you just buy, you plug your switch in, and it will work. You don't need to do any messing about with it at all. Um, you can pretty much switch adapt most toys. It needs to be something relatively simple. So nothing where I've got to squeeze one paw, lift one leg up, and twist somebody's ear in order to make them do something. Usually the kind of the kind of toy where literally I can turn it on and turn it off. And we do that by using these very small switch adapters. Uh, and that, that, there's a little picture of them on the bottom of the screen. I'm guessing most of you guys, um, with your experience, have already used these. Um, they had a habit um, a while ago of, um, of occasionally breaking, and that was usually because the children uh, the students would pull on the wires and eventually of course they'd pull the wire through the battery um, my single best tip with using battery adapters is to tie a knot in it uh, if you look at the screen and you look at where the little copper contact is just tie a knot right next to the little top top little copper contact tie a very simple knot there the adapter fits between fits between the battery and the, uh, the connector inside the battery box. You slide it in, fasten the battery back up and tighten it up, uh, and it works. If you tie the little knot in it, the knot's inside the battery box, and when the, when the student's pulling on the wire, they're actually pulling on the knot and not on the connector, uh, and they last a lot, lot longer. When we work with toys, we can work with them in lots of different ways, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about how we work with them uh, a bit later on. But it's worth mentioning that um, that to get the best out of toys, it's really it's really important that we that we have something like a switch latching timer. I think we used to call them slap devices, switch latching and timing devices. Um, and what that what that allows us to do is to change the way that the toy responds when the child presses the switch. So if we take our example as the uh, our beloved pig, if I press the switch and keep my hand on the switch, he'll keep walking. I take my hand off and it'll stop. Um, with the switch latching devices, I can change that so I can press the switch and the pig will walk for a length of time and then stop. But I can and I can decide how long that is, or I can press the switch and it'll start walking. And I press it again to stop, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But they are really useful. Um, some of the jelly beamer devices have switch switch latch timers built into them, and there's a little picture of one on the screen. Fantastic. You just plug it straight into your toy, tell it how you want it to work, and away you go. So there are lots and lots of toys. Um, if you're working with adults, there are still toys too. Um, I remember quite vividly working with a, with a post-16 group in a school in Manchester, uh, and their favorite switch-adapted toy was, um, was David from Little Britain, my colleague from the U.S. who may not know what Little Britain is. It's a comedy show here, which, is, um, which can be quite... Quite adult in its, some of its themes, and uh, the toy, when you press the switch, used to say things like, I'm the only gay person in the village. It was quite... Uh, but um, So look around, see what you want to do, uh, and, uh, and, and get some switch adapters and adapt it. There are um, some, some toy libraries, certainly in the UK, there are a number of toy libraries where toys have been 
um, already adapted, and you can uh, you can hire them. Uh, and I've seen some weird, some absolutely wonderful toys in there too. So, toys uh, are one of the ways in which we'll use it. Lots of toys, battery adapted things. How many people have got a foot spa? I bet every single one of you somewhere along the line has used a battery operated foot spa. Or one of those devices that spins paper around and we point, we pour paint on it to make the swirly paint patterns. All of those things can be switch adapted. The next thing we look at is, um, is using electrical devices. And for that we use a device called the Power Link. Um, the Power Link is a very, very um, flexible device. It allows us to to plug in an electrical, an electrical device at one end, um, and that may well be a, a liquidizer or a fan or, or some fiber optic lights or anything at all that can be operated by electricity. I say anything, there are some restrictions. Uh, and then we plug a switch into the other end and tell the power link how to operate it. Um, and again, we can do all of the, var the various ways of operating a switch through the power link. Um, really, really, really useful device. Um, it's important to mention if you're working with electrical devices that uh, to be safe, um, and certainly by far, with, when I've worked with children who have a habit of grabbing things and pulling things, uh, using things like a jelly beam is much, much better. I can plug a jelly beamer into the power link uh, and press the switch from a safe distance away from things without so the child can't actually grab them and pull them. There are some things that don't work with a power link. Um, those would be things like television sets, um, microwave ovens. Some microwave ovens don't. CD players are uh, another one that we get asked about. I get asked about quite a lot. Um, if the device, the way to test it really is, if you turned the power off at the at the wall and then turned it back on again, if the device came straight back on, then it will work with the power link. If it didn't. Uh, and it went back to standby mode, which is what TVs and CD players do, then then it won't work with a power link. And there are lots and lots and lots of wonderful ways in which you can use a power link. For example, you know, you could certainly uh, you could plug in, in in this example a liquidizer. I mean, what better way of learning to understand to understand cause and effect than actually making a smoothie and getting to drink it? Uh, but you can plug all manner of things in hair dryers, fans, all sorts of things. Um, so that's the power link. It has lots of settings which allow you to again alter the way that the switch works and and how we how that um, how it responds when we press the switch. Uh, and that can be that can be um, timing. So we press the switch and something will happen for a set length of time. It can be latching. We press the switch and it will turn something on and turn something off. Um, or it will, can be direct. I can keep my hand on the switch and, uh, and it will work while my hand's on the switch. Okay, moving to um, communicators. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Big Mac is my absolute favourite switch device, um, largely because I can use it in absolutely anything, um, and and they will fit pretty much into most of the of the skill levels that we talk about when we're working with switch users. So from a very early cause and effect level, pressing the switch and uh, and having something play. Uh, through to pressing something to to, uh, to complete a simple sequence, through to using two switches to make choices, uh, and you can you can see how we could use examples of that on the three devices at the top of the screen. We can also plug toys into um, into communicators too. So at a very simple level, I can I can press my Big Mac. It will say, "Look at the pig walking," and the pig will walk. Um, you just need to remember to record a message long enough so that you've got lots of time with the pig walking. Often people record the message, look at the pig walk, and then stop. What you need to do is record quite a long length of silence afterwards, and in that silence is when the pig will, will do most of its walking. So communicators are absolutely fantastic. You can see on the top there, I uh, had this picture of a, of a Big Mac with Hug Me on it. What a better way of using a Big Mac than to get somebody to come along and give you a hug, something quite physical and something quite nice. Um, and of course, using a Big Mac, it allows us to really, really personalize the message that comes out of it, the, the reward that the child's going to get for pressing it. So communicators will be, uh, will be part of your toolkit. 
Moving on to multi-sensory rooms, I have to say that I'm not really aware of what the current situation is in the US or in, in Australia and New Zealand, but certainly in the UK, it would be fair for me to say that, that multi-sensory rooms are probably the least well-used room uh, when it comes to teaching and learning with assistive technology, and yet they're filled with some of the most wonderful um, um, technology that, that, that we can immerse children into. Um, you can imagine a child who might have poor vision who's learning how to operate a switch, operating a bubble tube, um, and from that we would get um, a, a lovely visual reward of the lights and the bubbles going up the uh, up the tube, an auditory reward of hearing those bubbles and things, or maybe some music too, and a very kind of physical, tactile reward too of being able to hold the bubble tube and feel the vibration of that happening. And yet, you know, we, the, those rooms have wonderful technology, projectors where we can press a switch uh, and we can project fishes and things from under the sea. We can have music play, we can have light shows, and we can immerse a child in a, in a, in a complete multi-sensory environment that they're able to take control of. And yet, by and large, what happens with multi-sensory rooms is that none of that happens. Certainly in, in the UK, it's very common for whole classes to go into there. Uh, and what happens is people will they'll take their students' shoes off, they'll go in there, they'll turn all of the lights on, put some music on, and uh, and sit there. And, um, and, and I don't know what they call it, relaxation, chilling out, or whatever, but whatever it is, it's actually a very, very, very much wasted session. The multi-sensory room can be one of those an absolutely wonderful place to take children into experience and, and learn uh, to use switches away from the computer. However, we need to think very carefully about how we use it. It's pointless giving a child a switch with a bubble tube if all the other lights are all on. Basically, all we're going to do is, is distract the child with the other things that are happening in the room. Um, and hyper-stimulate people too with all of the uh, all of the stimulation that's happening around the room. So if we're using multi-sensory rooms, target specific things. It's much better to go in there for five minutes with one child than to go in there for 30 minutes with 10. Because 30 minutes with 10 children in there, you're really not going to get anything with any with a, the, the, anything done that will actually be very much used other than, other than going in there to chill out. Having said all of that, multi-sensory rooms are still a wonderful place to go, even if you're taking 10 people in there. You could quite easily theme your room around a book that you're reading in your class or around a topic that, uh, that your, class is, your class is studying this, uh, this term uh, and have to do some wonderful work in there too. So multi-sensory rooms are great. The other thing you need to remember about multi-sensory rooms, occasionally they have their own switches which for some children isn't a problem, um, the, um, but they're not the same switches sometimes that, um, that that children will use in the classroom. And for some kids that can cause a problem, especially when they've got bespoke switching systems, like head switches and things. Uh, you can buy a little adapter that will allow you to, to change the size of the plug to, so that the little switch, the 3.5 millimeter switch that's on, Jack that's on the end of a, a end of an able net switch, for example, will plug into multisensory equipment. Somewhere, somebody is going to ask me the question: Why do multisensory companies uh, make switches with great big plugs on uh, and make very strange-looking switches? Uh, and they do that because because they want you to buy their switches. So they put this equipment in and uh, they make their sets of switches work with it. And um, so you have to buy their switches too. Uh, and from our children's point of view, if we're, we've, we're working with a child with a specific switch, if we've decided that a jelly, a nice yellow jelly bean switch is the perfect switch for this child and it needs to be positioned in such a place, then we really need to, commit to, to ensure that level of consistency and make sure the child's got access to that. Um, so multi-sensory rooms, great, but need some thinking about. One switch, one light. One switch, one activity. Um, and work in that way. Okay, so those are the, that's the kind of technology that we're going to be using. Um, how are we going to use it? How does this fit in then with the way that children are actually learning to use a switch? Um, 
Uh, on the screen, I put a, uh, a little extract from the Switch Progression Roadmap booklet, and it's part of the it's part of the kind of flow chart, if you will, of skills. Really, um, next something happened is obviously a cause and effect level, uh, and you can see there we have four very separate types of activities, but all all related to each other at this level. Press and hold is pretty obvious. I put my hand on the switch. Uh, the, and the activity will continue until I take my hand off. Uh, press and let go is the kind of timed activity where I would press the switch and something would happen for a set length of time. That time is important um, and, and really it, you decide how long that is based on your knowledge of the student really. Um, for some children certainly with more profound intellectual difficulties they may need quite a long time in order to engage with something. So you know, if I press my switch and something happens, something a toy is starting to walk, if it walks only for five or ten seconds, a child might not have even got their head up from pressing the switch before the, before the toy will actually stop. So it's really, really important that, we're, that we, we tailor the amount of time and the length of the reward specifically to, to the needs of the child. And we do that by observing. Uh, observation, observation, observation. Look at children, see how they're responding to things, make some simple notes. Don't write books, one sentence, uh, but keep records of what's happening so that you know what it is that child's interested in, how they're working with the switch, and it will allow you then to tailor activities and more closely to, to the things that we know that motivate children. Press it again is... Uh, is um, is an activity where I'm pressing to complete a sequence. It's not like I'm just pressing to play a piece of music and then I press it again and it repeats and repeats and repeats. It's to complete a very simple sequence. And um, for example, um, we might press a switch to turn the pages and read out a story or something like that. So we have a we, we, we're using the switch to complete a simple sequence. And the the important skill here for the child is understanding that something changed when they press it. Uh, and the last one is, um, is turn on and turn off, and that's latching. So I press the switch, something, something starts, I press it again, and something stops. And the second part, which we'll be looking at, will be uh, playing with two switches. And I call it playing deliberately because it's not scanning. It's not step scanning, and nor should it be. This is giving a child an opportunity to play with two switches. Um, to, to, to maybe demonstrate preferences between, the, between the, the outcomes of pressing switches, to help them differentiate between the actions of one switch and another. Uh, and we do that by, with two separate types of activities, start and stop activities. Quite simply, press one switch to start, press the second switch to stop. And, and this and that activities, which are effectively choosing activities. Do I want this and press this switch? Or do I want that and press that, that switch? And, and that's what we'll be looking at. So these are, the, these are the skill levels that we'll be covering. And I mentioned earlier that we talked about different types of technology, using toys, using electrical devices, using communicators, uh, and using the multi-sensory room. So trying across that to add as much breadth as possible in, um, in, 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 into our use of switches with, uh, with, with the children that we work with. So, so I'm going to move on and, uh, and start by, by looking at each of these individual skill levels uh, and, and hopefully we'll be able to give you some examples of how that works and how we might use that. So the first one is press and hold. Um, some people, myself included, would say this is the easiest way for a student to understand cause and effect. Quite simply, they put their hand on the switch and while the switch is held down, the toy will work, or the bubble tube will, will bubble, or, um, or or whatever it is that's happening, the uh, the fan will play, or whatever. And, and while it's while your hands on it, it'll work. When I take my hand off, it stops, uh, and it's very concrete. Hand on, it's working. Hand off. From a student's point of view, it must be them making it work because it only works when their hands there. So it's really important that um, that. Um, that a nice, very easy way, cognitively easy way for a student to understand that. Um, it isn't for everybody. 
Um, not everybody can can get their hand to a switch and maintain pressure for any length of time. There are a group of students, certainly those students who have um, cerebral palsy and physical difficulties, might find that quite difficult. Um, it's easy to to do this kind of level with uh, with with all of those things. The, the the default kind of method of operation for most toys is keeping the switch down, um, and we've all seen it with the little pig. I keep my hand on the pig walks. I take it off. He stops. Uh, we can do that too with the power link, and we would set the power link to the direct setting, uh, and we would plug something in. Perhaps a fan. Certainly, a fan is quite a nice example. We would plug a fan in. And uh, and we maybe will attach some ribbons or some nice shiny material, tiny pieces of shiny material to the fan to add a visual element to that. While the child keeps their hand on the switch, the, f the fan will blow lovely warm air uh, at the child, and when they take their hand off, it stops. So we've got a very very physical effect. Um, with with pigs and elephants, it gets a bit more complicated. We need to think about things to make this this level a little bit more interesting. Um, and certainly, one of the best games I ever play with uh, with students by who keep their hand on the switch is to play the make sure it doesn't fall off the table game. In other words, I put the toy somewhere near the edge of the table, uh, and I'm ready to catch it. And I ask the child to to, uh, to make the to make the toy work, um, but then remind them so to make sure that it doesn't fall off the end of the table. And of course, they'll keep their hand on to try and make sure it does fall off the end of the table. Just be ready to catch it. Um, I've often done guess who games at this level too. I've got some very, very light cloth and I've covered the toys up with uh, with the cloth. Uh, and when I hold the, the child holds the switch down, the toy will walk out from underneath the cloth. And we have a little guessing game as to which, which, uh, which toy is going to walk out. Um, it's usually quite an easy game. It's either a pig or an elephant. So, so at this level, hold the switch down, something happens, the pig walks, the fan works, the bubble tube will bubble, and I take my hand off, it stops. So that's press and hold. The next of those early cause and effect levels are, are uh, is, is called press and let go on. That's basically the timer. Um, so, so we will press the switch, uh, and something will happen for a set length of time. I mentioned earlier about 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 the way that uh, the length of time that we use uh, and trying to uh, make sure that that's that's sufficient for the person to 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 be able to get their head up, look and see what's happening, enjoy the reward, and then notice that it's stopped. Um, in other words, to be ready to be prompted to make that start again. Um, time things are absolutely fantastic. A lot of the toys that um, the switch adapted toys that we buy already have have time modes built into them already. They'll play for a certain length of time. Um, if not, you can certainly do that with uh, with your switch latch timer. You would just use the timed in seconds mode uh, and set that to the set num the number of seconds that you want the the reward to last for. Um, electrical devices too. You have exactly the same setting on the on the uh, power link too. You would use timed seconds. Set it for the number of seconds that you want to work with, uh, and it will go. Um, I suppose the classic example of Big Mac is, is uh, at this level is a Big Mac, which it can play. Um, we press the switch, and it will it will generate a reward um, for a set length of time, however long you've recorded, um, and then stop, and the child will press the switch again. The example I've got on the screen there is a Big Mac with some music. Uh, and I've done this many, 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 many times with uh, with students. So give the give one of the children the the Big Mac with some music on, and got everybody else to dance to it. Um, and I have an example here uh, on my Big Mac. music they hear hearing there was from a training session that we did two weeks ago in a school. I got them all to sing a song because we didn't have any music. Um, that's worth mentioning, largely because, because what the students are actually responding to might not be the music. It very well could be you dancing to it. And they may very well be interested in you singing it. 
or somebody else singing it, or sound effects. It's not just about what's coming out of the device, it's about what's happening around the student. We certainly talked about that in some of the previous sessions, that actually uh, a child's understanding of cause and effect is not always specifically the reward that's generated, it's sometimes what happens around the child and how the people respond to, the, to that reward. So timed activity is fantastic. Press a switch, something happens for a set length of time, and and then when it finishes, we would then prompt the child to um, to press the switch again. Of course, we wouldn't say press the switch because that would be the wrong way to do it. Um, we really, really, really don't want to to change the child's focus from what's happening uh, with the toy or with the bubble tube or with the with the lights and the fan. Uh, and change their focus back to the switch again. So I would never say, press the switch, Jimmy. I would say, let's have that fan, Jimmy, or let's have some more music, Jimmy, and keep the focus specifically on the reward and on the output from the switch, not for, not, not, not the switch itself. So do try and remember that. Okay, the next, um, the next level then would be press it again. Uh, and press it again, as I mentioned, isn't the same as uh, isn't the same as the timed activity. Just pressing that over and over again, uh, it's actually completing a very simple sequence. So a sequence, um, for example, um, we might use a step by step communicator and record a very simple story on that. So by pressing the switch um, a number of times, each time I pressed it, another part of the story would be read out. Jasper's beanstalk. On Monday, Jasper found a bean. On Tuesday, he planted it. And every time I press the switch, another part, another part of the story will come out. Um, or we could put on there all sorts of different instructions and commands too. So, for example, um, a nice example we've used in school is we would put um, doing words on there. So, so jump and hop and dance and skip. Uh, and every time the people in... Um, Every time the people, uh, the child heard, every time the child pressed the switch, everybody would have to do what was on the, what, what came out from, from the switch. Uh, and again, it would be something different every time. Now, there are some communications uh, communicators that have a random feature, uh, where basically we record uh, a series of messages, very simple messages, like jump, hop, dance, any of those things, or even Simon Says things. Um, and... Um, and we record uh, something quite, you know, uh, and, and whenever the child presses the switch, something will come out at random, uh, and, we, and the child never really knows what's going to come. So um, those can be really fun games. Uh, if you ever do buy one of those, uh, one of those randomised devices, have a read of the instructions, uh, and you'll see what happens when things get translated poorly. One of the suggestions that the company who make this um, give um, as an example of how it might be used is random calls for help uh, and you can just imagine the child busy pressing the switch the trousers are on fire nope not that one the school's on fire nope not that one so random calls for help would be completely stupid um, so but um, lots of things and um, we've certainly done things like um, rat rat cat and things like that where the child's actually in charge of organizing the game um, so and that can be very 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 useful so press it again it's pressing the switch a number of times to complete a simple sequence um, and not just pressing the switch to repeat an activity uh, and the last in this uh, the, the, these little part early cause and effects parts uh, switching on and switching off um, and that that's pretty much what people call latching um, and it's I, I always leave it until last because I think it's probably of the three it's probably the most difficult one to, for children to get their head around because up until now whenever I press the switch or whenever the student presses the switch it does the same thing so if I press the Big Mac, it always gives me a message. The message may be different, but it always works in the same way. Uh, and likewise, if I press the switch in the multi-sensory room, the bubble tube will start, uh, and it will play for something and stop. With latching, the switch has two modes. I press it, and, and something will start, and I press it again, and something will stop. Uh, and that, that actually is a little bit more complicated than 
for example, where, we, where we're pressing the switch and just making something happen, where, what we're saying to the child is the switch has two separate functions. Um, so often when I introduce this kind of thing, I'll introduce it with music, um, and I'll, I'll put, um, I'll have two switches, and, sorry, I'll have one switch which is, which is turning on and turning off. The first time it's turned, it's pressed, it'll turn that music on. Uh, and usually what I'll do is I'll put some music on that the child actually likes and enjoys, uh, and it will start to play. Uh, and then I'll do Mr. Bad Teacher, and I'll say, that's awful, turn it off. Uh, and the student, and, now, and then I'll press the switch to turn it off, and of course the student will then press the switch to turn it on. Um, and we start to introduce that concept, and it's, quite, it's much easier for the child to understand it if we're doing it in that way. Um, sometimes I flip that round, perhaps I'll... Um, Perhaps I'll put some music on like this. And of course the student will press the switch to turn it off because and who wouldn't? It's pretty dreadful. Um, so turning the, turning, the, um, turning the whole thing around. So latching is quite, uh, it's quite an interesting concept and it's one which children need to, get, need to, need to be able to understand. Uh, and again, we can do that with all sorts of different devices. If we're doing that with toys, we'd use the switch latch timer uh, and set it to latching. I press the switch and the toy will continue working until I press it again to stop. If we're using electrical devices, uh, bubble tubes, or fiber optic devices, or any of those kind of things, um, we, would use, we would use the power link and we'd set, use the setting for latching. Press the switch, it would start to work. Press the switch, and it would stop. Um, and if we're using uh, if we're using music, I think we can do that too. So, so those are the four most common ways in which we would use we would use a switch away from the computer at, at, at the four most common um, skill levels. And and it's important that we try and do that in as many different ways as possible to try and get as much breadth in as we possibly can. So so using all of those four. Um, different skill levels in lots of different ways. Um, for example, um, at, at press and let go, you know, we could certainly um, we could certainly put something on there which would interact with uh, messages which would allow people to interact with what's happening in the in, in the classroom. With press and hold, we can we can make activities that would do that too. Once we're once we're re relatively sure that, um, that the, the student has got an under, a good understanding of that. We might then want to introduce two switches. Um, two switches give, um, give us an opportunity to do a couple of things. The first is for the child to, to, to begin to be able to differentiate between the actions of the switch. So, uh, and we would, um, we would provide two switches with two separate activities, so to effectively two separate cause and effect activities. I press, I press one switch and something will happen, press another switch and something else will happen. Or, I would press a switch to start something and press a switch to stop something. Um, either way, the child's learning to differentiate between the actions of two switches. We need to be sure that the child can, is physically able to do that. Um, although, although I have worked with some children where, where they've really only had one switch that would work, but I would bring another switch in and let them have uh, and take it away when uh, when we're done. Um, all of the things that we've talked about so far, all of the different devices will work with two switches, so we can certainly operate toys with two switches, do a switch latch timer, I think it's called a dual. Um, we can certainly do that with the power link, we can connect two switches to the power link uh, and operate two separate devices through the power link. You need to be careful with some of those power link type devices. Certainly the power link works, but there are other devices uh, on the market that have two sockets. But actually, they only work with one channel. So effectively, you plug two separate uh, electrical devices in, maybe maybe a hairdryer uh, and a fan or a bubble tube and a light. But you're only, although it's got two switches, you can only actually turn on and turn off both devices at the same time. So you can't actually use those devices for timing. So I would always recommend that uh, you use the power link because we know it does have two the two channels and is able to do that. Um, with communicators, the options are to use two separate Big Macs or to use the iTalk 2, and there's a nice example on the screen where a child might use that to, to choose between two separate toys. I mentioned earlier that, um, that we can connect toys directly to, to the Big Mac and to the iTalk 2. 
um, and uh, children can choose that. It would get a message, a nice reinforcing message, and the toy would work. Um, I've got a nice example here from um, of um, of press it again, uh, and it goes like this. Hey, I've got something to show you. Come and have a look. It's a dinosaur. And if you haven't heard the roaring dinosaur, here goes. Watch this. You know, they say the T-Rex is the king of the dinosaurs. So, that's cool. Absolutely fantastic. So we can use two switches to in, in lots and lots and lots of different ways. So with, with certainly with the toy that box, we could um, we could offer the child the opportunity to to play with the dinosaur or with the pig. Uh, or if uh, if you're creative enough and um, and maybe brave enough, we could have a game where the dinosaur could eat the pig, which I'm sure the children would learn. So two switches, two things really, and there are two skill levels that we want to look at. The first is start and stop, which is effectively the latching, but now we're using two switches to do that. Um, and we would we would have one switch to start something and the other switch to stop something. The game that I mentioned earlier, the good teacher, bad teacher, child starts a piece of music that they like, you come along and turn it off, uh, is always a great introduction to that. Um, but then there are loads of other ways to do that too. Um, we did a very simple video project in school, and I had a whole group of children who um, who operated the lights for our uh, our school, our class play. Um, and basically, we plugged we plugged we plugged some angle poise lamps into uh, into a power link, uh, and children were able to press one switch to turn the lights on. So when we were ready to video, we would shout "Lights, please!" and of course the child would press the switch to turn the lights on. And when we we're done, they could press the switch to uh, to turn them off again. So they're very simple activities. Press one switch to start something. Press the switch to stop something. The next would be um, would be choosing really, uh, and uh, in the booklet we talked about this or that, um, and, and effectively that's what it is. We provide the child with two switches, each of which uh, would give them a very separate cause and effect type activity. On the picture I've got on the screen. Um, you can see that um, through the little switch latch timer, we're able to to plug in two separate toys with two separate switches, and the child can choose to have this one or that one, um, and and uh, and and often another process, um, learn to make some choices and also demonstrate preferences. Um, another really great way to do it, and this is fantastic if you're ever interested in trying to get children engaged with your storytelling. So when you're reading a book out for a child, for, uh, for your class, give children um, a Big Mac switch with sound effects that relate to the story. Um, so, for example, in my story, I've got here, I've got a hero and a villain. So whenever I mention the name of the hero, I'd, I'd be looking for the child to press the switch with the picture of the hero on it, uh, and it would cheer for the hero. Uh, and whenever I mention the, the villain's name. I'd, I'd be looking for the child to press the switch with the picture of the villain on it, uh, and it would boo the villain. Um, and again, there, there are two outcomes from that. One is the child is really, really, really engaged in your storytelling in a way that perhaps they might not be normally. Uh, and two, they're learning to use two different switches and differentiate between the actions of both of those two switches. It doesn't have to be um, heroes and villains. It could be animal noises. If you're telling a story about about the farm, a farmyard, or some or a farmer, or something like that, or animals in the jungle, um, you can have record noise, the, the sound effects from all of those different animals and just drop in their names, even if they're not in the story. Drop them in. So the cow and the and the chicken uh, and the children would be listening for those words and pressing the switch in order to uh, in order to uh, to take part in that. Even if you're not working with switches, get the Big Macs out of the cupboard and do it with everybody. It's a great game to play, and uh, and and children really really enjoy it. So, so um, two switches, making two choices. That and we could do that with with toys. We could do that with a power link. We could have two separate activities with the power link. We could also have two separate activities on two different messages with the Big Mac. And in the multi-sensory room, we could choose between having this bubble tube play or the putting a projector on or any of those, or both of them. 
Um, a long time ago, we used to call that building an environment. We could turn things on and turn things off depending upon how we wanted to do that. So those are the those are the kind of common skill areas that we would be looking at um, and looking to fit in activities of all of the, at, at all of those different levels. I'm going to just mention um, before I move on um, just some brief tips about um, about things like uh, switch tapping. Because this is this is just as much a problem uh, away from the computer as it is um, when we're using the computer. We do get students who repeatedly bang on switches, you know, the kind of this kind of thing with switches. And uh, and I'm sure that uh, with all of your experience, you guys know just as much as well as I do that you know there are lots of reasons for that. You know, the most obvious reason is that the child absolutely does not understand what it is that that switch does. Uh, and it's just there, and it's something that I can play with, and I can bang and tap and uh, and enjoy. Um, with children like that, we need to start at a very early level, often holding out, you know, modelling what we're going to do, helping the child put their hand on the switch, uh, and getting them to look at the effects of the switch. So look at the pig one moving, look at the dinosaur, look at the lovely bubbles, and 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 then take the child's hand off. Uh, and do it that way, and, and actually sort of begin to understand the, the role the switch plays in providing that. There are other students who enjoy the tactile nature of the switch itself, so by just, just touching it, it's great, it's very, very tactile, it feels wonderful, uh, and it's quite interesting for the child to press it just as it is. Um, for those children, um, it's probably better to look at a different kind of switch, so there are there are uh, pad switches. Um, there's one on my screen with an orange circle. It has no moving parts at all. There's nothing to press, nothing to click. I'd simply touch that orange circle, uh, and something works, and whatever it is will happen. Um, so there's no tactile sensation. Um, the other reason, which is quite an obvious one too, is that they bang it to get your attention. That uh, it's like a big "bring my teacher to me" button. The more I hit it, the louder the noise, the sooner my teacher will come over and talk to me. So if that's the case, um, you need to think about how you respond to when, when children are banging, well, the child's banging the switch and doing that. Certainly in a school that I visited a few, uh, a few months ago, they came up with a quite unique way of responding to children, certainly those children on the, on the autistic spectrum. They didn't want to... Um, they didn't want to seem threatening, so they tried to sing to people. They thought that whenever we needed to talk to a child, we'd sing to them. Um, so I went along to see a child who was banging a switch. The teacher said to me, if you could just observe from the back of the classroom and see how things go. So I'm sat watching. The child's given the switch. The child starts to, starts to bang on the switch. teacher comes over and starts singing. Johnny, Johnny, don't bang the switch. And, of course... Um, the teachers and the teachers looking at me. I'm looking at the teacher and thinking this child has a fantastic understanding of cause and effect. He's banging the switch to make you come and sing to him. So you know there were there. So we just used a slightly different strategy. We put uh, some interesting things on the switch, much more interesting than having his teacher come over and sing to him. And that overcame that. Uh, there's a picture on there of a switch that looks like um, that looks like a, a cookie, a biscuit, um, an Oreo biscuit. Um, Please, 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 if you're going to use switches uh, on the computer or away from the computer, don't use switches that look like uh, biscuits and things. I don't know where or how anybody thought of the idea that if I make a, a switch look like a cookie uh, and give a child it to chew, that they'll understand that they're making something happen by chewing it. Um, certainly the children we work with who have complex intellectual difficulties, who really struggle to understand the world around them, we give them something that looks like something that they can eat. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it's made of rubber. It doesn't taste of anything, uh, and we're, we're expecting them to operate a toy or a bubble tube or a, or a computer by chewing it. It's nonsense. So avoid things like that. Um, also, don't cover switches with fur or anything like that. There's only one real reason I think for for, for covering switches with fur. Often people will cover them and put furry things on top of them in the hope that if they have a child who's not initiating, if I put, make it furry and interesting for them to feel, that they might touch it and press it and feel the fur and, and in doing so understand that they're making toys work. It's, all it, that does is really frustrate um, your 
efforts to try and help the child understand what the switch does. How can you ever be, be sure that the child's pressing the switch to make something happen? Or they're not just simply touching the switch because it's, because it's furry? So we need to be, uh, be careful with those things. Switch caps will help if you're working with a, with a, with a, um, with our friend the dinosaur. Put a picture of the dinosaur on the switch. Uh, and that can help the child relate to the picture on the switch. I see the dinosaur there. I touch the dinosaur, and the dinosaur works. And from a you know from a cognition point of view, you know it helps to make that link, that remote link between the action of the switch and what what the dinosaur is actually doing and making that happen. So use the switch cups. Um, and I'm sure just about every single school, every anywhere these days has something like a flip camera the little portable cameras that we can put in our pockets and things, use those to take some video as evidence. Simple, short clips uh, where we're seeing children do things um, and, and make sure that we keep those, uh, and which allow us then to refer back to that to see if they're making progress. So make some simple notes, but also take some little video clips. That's a great way of doing it. So, so from a point of view of using switches, avoid... Um, strange switches that look, that we have to chew or feel because they're furry and tactile. You switch a switch is just a means to an end. I press this, it makes something happen. Make it obvious by putting a pic picture on it uh, and look at the tapping behavior. If we've got that, look at ways and uh, strategies in which we can uh, which we can do that. Um, and irrespective of whether we're using uh, switches on a computer in the multi sensory room or we're using communicators or whatever we're using. Before we move students on beyond this stage, be absolutely, absolutely sure that your student understands cause and effect, uh, that you've seen it in a range of different contexts. So it's not just one child sat in front of a computer, like this child, pressing the switch with switch it weather, um, that you've seen that child use switches with toys, with communication devices, with electrical devices, in the multi-sensor room, um, on, and in lots and lots of different different circumstances, and that they actu actually understand what that switch does, that it's making that, that effect happen. Uh, and when you're sure of that, you're absolutely sure of that, that's the time to move them on. But until you're sure, don't. Stay, stay at a cause and effect level. I know there'll be some people will argue with me about this, but stay at a cause and effect level and generalize that skill. As long once that child understands that pressing a switch is, is what's I can make something happen by pressing it, we can then move them on to more complicated activities where which will move us towards step scanning. So one switch timing activities, I press the switch and something or something where I see something and I want something's in a particular place and I press it to make something happen. Or with two switches, the concept of move and get. So this one's moving through my choices and this one's selecting it. You can use toys and things at those levels. It's a, you need to be very creative, though. Um, there was a lovely example just recently when I visited school, and um, and we got a we got a, a, a chap to uh, to walk across the room, and uh, and when he when he hit our big circle, uh, which we pressed strategically on the on the floor, if the child pressed the switch when the, when this chap was on the on the circle. Um, we we decided previously that uh, that he had to dance and sing like Britney Spears, so um, so the so the, the, the colleague in school would would kind of walk around this circle and then step on it. A child pressed the switch. He would then have to do his Britney Spears impression. What we were doing was a timing and a, and a, a tracking activity. The child was tracking the the colleague across the floor, waiting until they were in the right place and then pressing the switch when that happens, so effectively learning the skills you would need for, for single switch scanning. Um, and of course you get to see your colleague pretend to be Britney Spears too, so that's always good. Um, I'd just like to finish, really, um, by, by showing you this slide. I show it pretty much every single webinar because it's so important. There's a picture of a pencil there, uh, and that's a pencil. Uh, when I was When I was barely but a baby in arms, somebody thrust a pencil into my hand and every single day since that um, I've used it. When I was in elementary school, my elementary teacher gave me that pencil and coloured pencils uh, throughout the school day and gave me lots of opportunities to practice using that pencil because she knew and everybody else around me knew 
that that pencil would be my way of interacting and, commu and communicating with the world. It would be my way of getting what's in my head uh, and sharing that with a wider audience. I'd be able to write things down, draw pictures, uh, and share them with, uh, with, with a much wider audience than pe everybody I could speak to. Uh, and my teachers all knew that, and they engineered as many opportunities for me to be able to practice using that pencil as they possibly could. Think back to your own days in elementary school, and infant school. How many times your teacher gave you pencils to draw things, colour things in, make patterns, write letters, all of those things. And she was doing that to, to, to generalise that pencil skill. Think about our switch users. Uh, for those children, the switch is their pencil. It will be their way of interacting with the world, whether it's through a communication aid, I press the switch and, and I'm passing messages, or whether it's through a computer with more sophisticated switch users, writing emails and writing documents. Uh, Stephen Hawking writes his books by pressing two switches. But it's important that, they, that as much emphasis is placed on giving them an opportunity to practice their skills as, as, as it would be for a child who's using a pencil. Um, I'll finish with this last slide, and it's got three uh, links to websites. The first one is AbleNet's website, where you'll be able to see all of the things that I've talked about. Do look at the Switch, the switch toys. There are a vast range of them now, and they're wonderful. Uh, and you'll finally be able to replace that dreaded pig and elephant. Um, the Switch Progression Roadmap, which pulls together all of the things that we've talked about in the four sessions up to now, uh, looking at the skill levels and lots and lots of examples of how we can use switches at all of these different levels. It's free. Click that link, and it'll, there's a link there to download it for free. Uh, and the final one is uh, Priory Woods website, where there's still about 150 simple activities that you can use with switches. So, um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to uh, shout out.